Good evening once again as we, as you are probably watching me and I was going to forgot what to say, but uh, it's Wednesday night Bible study tonight and uh, we're going to continue through our study in the book of Galatians, Galatians 4 this evening and uh, Paul, we, uh, we talked about the purpose for Paul writing the book of Galatians and for the case that he made about being a real genuine apostle and now he finishes the chapter chapter one by telling the Galatians that he really is indeed a changed man so let's begin in chapter 1 verse 20 and we're going to read till the end of the chapter now the things which I write unto you beloved before God I lie not afterwards I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia and was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed, and they glorified God in me. Now Paul, you'll find that throughout this chapter, there's a few things that he repeats, and, uh, and sometimes I have to be honest with you, I have to repeat some things. Paul had to get it through the Galatians' head. Their heads were probably and obviously hard uh, that he received the gospel that he preached to them by direct revelation. He makes mention of that several times in this first chapter. And uh, he says, I am really an apostle. I'm not a charlatan. I'm not faking it. Uh, but I really am. And he says here in verse 20 that uh, he, he actually takes an oath and he says to them, Before God, I lie, I lie not. I am telling you the truth. I'm not lying to you. How many times do we have to tell it to people? Look, uh, God's honest truth, or uh, I don't think we should take God's honest truth, but the honest truth, and uh, I swear, uh, cross my fingers, hope to die, and all the little things we used to say as kids, right? We used to take oaths uh, because we were telling the truth that we, want, we really wanted people to believe us. So here Paul says uh, in verse 19, I think, 18 or 19, he tells them that he went to Tarsus. He fled to Tarsus, actually. And then he said he made his way to Syria and Cilicia. And as he was traveling those regions, Paul ended up in Antioch of Syria, where he became a member of the church there. Acts 13, verse 1, the Bible tells us, Now, that now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manaen, which had been brought up with Hedra, Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Here the Saul is Paul himself. <coughs> and Paul uh, tried to stay away from Jerusalem. As we looked at uh, last week's lesson, he was, only, he was only there once, and he only met, he tells us, with Peter and James and no one else. And Paul testifies uh, that the saints in Judea, the churches in Judea, did not know who he really was. They never met him face to face. All they knew was that he who persecuted the church now preaches Christ himself. The churches of Judea, and that's you can see in Acts chapter 9 verse 31 is a reference, they did not know Paul personally until he shows up again in Acts chapter 15 when he spends quite a bit of time in Jerusalem regarding the controversy between uh, salvation and the law. Uh, but the only thing they did know about him and which was the most important thing about Paul, was the fact that Paul was now a changed man. He was a born-again Christian. Uh, he who persecuted the religion called Christianity, we can say that, is now serving the same, the Christ that he was persecuting. He was one of them. That's all they knew about him. Now, I want to take a, a pause here in, in teaching on the book of Galatians. I want to make some comments that came to mind as I was preparing this lesson. And I want to tread on some dangerous ground. And I call it dangerous ground for a reason, and you'll know why. There is an expectation, and right, rightfully so, that when a person gets saved, that he or she changes. That he or she changes. Uh, and that's very important. Because in 2 Corinthians 5.17, the Bible says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. And we expect people to change after they receive Christ as Savior. We've all heard of the testimonies of former addicts, abusers, abused, criminals, drunks, thieves, those who were rejected by society, 
uh, they come to a low point in their life after having lost everything, they cry out to God and they cry out for salvation. And God reaches down from heaven and saves their soul and gives them the new birth. And then they change immediately. Uh, they have no withdrawals, no relapses, and their life is filled with the joy of God and the peace of God and the love of God. But you have some of us who were brought up in a Christian home, and we didn't really perceive a change in our life because how much sin can a six-year-old or seven-year-old or ten-year-old do? Uh, they're not drunks. They haven't lived the life of the world. And there is no real change that occurs. The Holy Spirit, yes, does come, come in because the Bible says the moment you call upon the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved. But, and then you realize that as these kids who got saved at a young age, when they grow up, they commit more sins than they did before they got saved. Because that's, they, some of them, they decide to try the world. They sold their wild oats and before coming back to the Lord. But some of them stay out in the world and never come back to the Lord. So the point I'm trying to make is that when you see someone who claims to be a born again Christian, yet lives like the world, we may question that person's salvation and we may say, is he or she really saved? I don't see a change in this person's life. But, but the truth is only God knows the heart. Only God knows whether that person has been converted or not. Now, if someone who used to live like the devil professes Christianity and says, I got saved and still lives like the devil, there has been absolutely no change in their life, no desire to go to church, no desire to serve God, no desire to read or pray or anything that you would expect from a, a, a Christian, then you can rightly question whether that person was saved or not. And I would actually say, I would propose to you that that person never got saved. It was just a simple profession of faith, like I did when I was the, uh, 12 years old. My uncle you know, put some pressure on me and my sister and my cousin, his daughter, and he taught us the importance of salvation, and we buckled under the pressure, and we knelt down and we prayed to receive Christ but I can tell you when I got up from that floor off that couch uh, I, I wasn't saved because it was there was no conviction there so and I hear a lot of people that go uh, knocking on doors and I don't I don't knock knocking on doors it's a good thing uh, they lead people to the Lord at the door uh, these people never go to church never open their Bible never pray and a lot of times I've seen these people they put a lot of psychological pressure on them you know they, they know the buzzwords they have uh, mastered the art of manipulation because all they've been taught is that get, get, get them to say the sinner's prayer. The sinner's prayer is not some kind of magic formula that saves anyone. It's just words. It's a man believes with the heart, the Bible says. So Paul was really saved. He was a changed man. And the saints, he says to the people of Galatia, uh, you know, the, the saints of Jerusalem are rejoicing. They're praising God about my salvation because now they have rest. I was, I was, I was persecuting them. Now they have rest. And uh, Paul tells them that Christ is in him and God is in him. And I, as as we were, as we read this, we should be reminded of John chapter 17 when Christ says that He and the Father will come and dwell in the believer. In John chapter 17, verse 21. And I'll read 23 also. Jesus says this, they, That they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Verse 23, I in them, and thou in me. Christ in us, and God in Christ. And Christ in God. And us in God, and us in Christ. So, it's like, uh, if I were to try to describe it to you, it's like, it's like uh, something like this, <laughs> you know? Uh, we're in Christ, God is in Christ, Christ is in God, we're in God, uh, God is in us. Uh, can you really comprehend that? I'm not trying to make light of it, but so it's, it's, inc it's an incredible concept to try to grasp that I am in Christ and that Christ is in me. And you look around me and you see, I don't see Christ around. Uh, I don't see his, his entrails, his heart, his lungs, you know, but spiritually speaking, we are in Christ and he is in us. Uh, and this is what Paul testifies. In verse 22, he says, uh, we all are in Christ. And verse 24 says that God is in me. So uh, I am in Christ and God is in me and Christ is in God and God is in Christ. I'm not, again, I'm not trying to make light of it, but try to grasp that concept. It's one of those things that you just have to take it by faith. 
and believe that spiritually speaking, uh, God lives in us and we know that. And uh, according to the Bible, it says we are in Christ and we are seated in heavenly places next to him. So for the believer to go to heaven is just to go, you're, you're going to go to your final destination. I've taught this before and I say the life of a believer is basically waiting at the train station, uh, waiting for the train to come pick you up and take you to your final destination. So now let's uh, go to chapter 2. That, that brings us to the end of chapter 1. Uh, chapter 2, we're going to read the first uh, two verses. And here Paul tells them that he eventually did return to Jerusalem. Verse 1 of chapter 2 of, in the book of Galatians. Then 14 years after, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. Very important. I communicated unto them, I told them about the gospel that God has called me to preach. Remember, Paul made the case that he was not taught the gospel by any man, but by direct revelation of Christ. And this is important, we'll get into this in a moment. And communicated unto them that the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. So, uh, from the time that Paul begins writing the book of Galatians, we know that uh, he, he went for a brief moment to Jerusalem, and then uh, 14 years later, he returned to Jerusalem. So where did he spend most of that time? He spent it in Arabia and in Damascus before returning to Jerusalem. And also, he says, he spent some time in Tarsus and Syria and Cilicia and, and Antioch. So Paul didn't spend much time in Jerusalem because that's not where God wanted him to work. Uh, everyone has a place. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a place where God wants you to serve. I would never have figured out in my wildest dreams that uh, when I was a kid that God would bring me to Orlando, Florida, of all places. Born and raised in Montreal, Canada, and God has me here in Orlando, Florida. Only God can do uh, something like that. God has a place for you to serve. Uh, God has a church for you to belong to. You need to find the church that God wants, to, wants you to be part of. And, and if you find that, be faithful to it. If you're not going to, uh, uh, you know, this church is not for everybody. You know, some people want to hear whatever they want to hear. Go find a church that you can, I, I'm not going to, I'm stuttering because I, the Holy Spirit's telling me, uh, just shut your mouth and just keep teaching the lesson. So, uh, so Paul says, it, after 14 years, he went back to Jerusalem. And the reason why he tells the Galatians this to point to the fact that, hey, I was not taught by the apostles. Mm -hmm. Again, I was not taught by the apostles. The gospel that I preach was given to me by the revelation of God. And this visit here in chapter 2, in the beginning of chapter 2, coincides with Paul's visit in Acts chapter 15. You see where he tells to them, Then fourteen years later, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. Why do you think he went to Jerusalem? We know in Acts chapter 15, the purpose of Paul's visit was to sort out the problems regarding grace and the law. The relationship between salvation and the law. And we have dealt with this topic in lesson 1 and lesson 2. We need to remind you again that the Judaizers taught that you have to, be, uh, that you have to do something to be saved and, that, and then also that you have to do something to stay saved. There's a lot of uh, denominations that teach that today. I grew up in one of them. They didn't teach you how to do anything to be saved, but they taught that you to do something to stay saved. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I'm very well aware of those verses. And uh, I was, my, my whole entire upbringing as a kid, as a teenager, as a, and I only was exposed to eternal security when I was 16 or 17 years of age. And at the beginning, I thought it was a heresy. What are these people talking about? You can't lose your salvation. Don't they read the Don't they read the Bibles? And we knew all the verses. I knew all the verses where you can lose your salvation. They say, how How can you say that? Well, the Bible does say. Uh, I don't have time for that, but uh, I tell my children uh, that uh, you, if you don't rightly divide the word of truth, and if you don't take the context into account, uh, you can teach anything from the scriptures. Seriously, you can teach anything from the scriptures if you take it out of context. If you don't, and that's why I became a dispensationalist, because uh, 
And I'm not going to get into that. When we went through the book of James, we spent a little bit of time on that. I'm not going to uh, spend any more time on that. But if you want to know why we are dispensationalists, look at the study in the book of James where in the first few lessons we spent quite a bit of time discussing dispensationalism. So these Judaizers uh, taught these, this heresy, and they were believers actually. If, and uh, we may touch on it again, I don't know if I have it in my lesson, my notes here, but you can go back in lesson one and lesson two, and we showed you the verses. They were believers, they were saved people, but yet they taught heresy. And Paul uh, uh, tried to set them straight, but they didn't want to listen to Paul. And Paul says, okay, uh, the, the argument was pretty severe. And they said, okay, look, Paul, why don't you go to Jerusalem, sort this out, and then come back and tell us what the answer is. And that's what Paul did. He went to Jerusalem, and he tells the Galatians that he did this, and he took with him Paul, uh, sorry, he took with him Paul. He was Paul, uh, but he took with him Barnabas and Titus. Now, what do we know about Barnabas? Barnabas himself was an apostle, and he was well-respected. But Titus was a Greek. You can't avoid those Greeks. Uh, Titus was a Gentile convert. But Titus, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about Titus because Titus was an incredible individual uh, and he was a uh, Paul's fellow worker. <clears throat> In fact, there's an epistle that Paul writes to Titus where he sends him to Cyprus and he asks him to ordain elders in every church over there. Uh, Titus was a man who was faithful and a man that Paul could count on. Doesn't it disappoint you when you have a friend that you think they're a friend, but when push, push comes to shove and you call them for in a time of need, they're nowhere to be found? You, Titus was not like that. Titus was, Paul was able to count on Titus. I want to give you uh, just a few verses regarding Titus, and then we'll continue with the lesson. 2 Corinthians 2.13 and it's obvious from uh, the, the epistle, to the, the second epistle to the Corinthians, that Paul had sent Titus to find their uh, well-being, to, to inquire of well-being. 2 Corinthians 2.13, the Bible says, I had no rest in my spirit because I found not Titus my brother, he calls him his brother, but taking my leave of them, I went from thence into Macedonia. 2 Corinthians 7.6, Nevertheless, God that comforteth those who are cast down comforted us by the coming of Titus. You see what Paul's saying? Paul, Titus comforted me. Uh, sometimes when you fellowship with certain believers, they're a comfort to you. But sometimes when you fellowship with other believers, don't you, don't they, don't you feel like they drag you down? You're like, oh my goodness, when is he going to leave this person? When is she going to leave? Uh, because they drag you down because they're not filled with the Holy Spirit. They're filled with the things of this world. 2 Corinthians 8, 6, in so much that we desired Titus, that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace also. Uh, 2 Corinthians 8, 16, but thanks be to God, which put the same earnest care unto the heart of Titus for you. Paul saying, Titus cares about you the same way I do. So when he comes to you, do not reject him. 2 Corinthians 8, 23, whether any do inquire of Titus, Paul saying, if you guys are asking who this guy is, let me tell you, he is my partner and my fellow helper concerning you, or our brethren, uh, or our brethren be inquired of, they are the messengers of the churches and the glory of, of Christ. And Paul saying, Titus is my, my buddy here. I trust him completely. He cares about you as much as I care you. And that's, that's strong words for Titus. If uh, Paul had favorites, which he probably did. Titus would be on that list of his top guys. Who, who are other people that uh, Paul you would, uh, would consider his favorites if there was such a list? Luke, Luke Titus, yes. Barnabas. Barnabas, the beginning of his ministry, correct? Timothy. Timothy, yes, that's a good one. You see, those are the people that hung out with Paul uh, and he enjoyed sweet fellowship with them. John Mark, later on, at the beginning, John Mark was a disappointment, but Paul said uh, something happened to John Mark, and he came back, and Paul said he was, a, uh, he was faithful, and he was profitable. He was profitable. And we're going to get to Titus when we get to uh, verse 3 of, of this book a little bit. Uh, in verse 2, Paul tells us that he went to Jerusalem by revelation. So does the Bible contradict itself? Because in Acts 15, 
verse 2, we are told they, that's the leaders of the church in Antioch, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. The they, it refers to the church leadership in the church in Antioch. So Paul says he went up by revelation to Jerusalem, but Acts 15.2 tells us that they sent Paul, Barnabas, and others, and we know that one of the others was Titus. So what is it? Is the Bible contradicting itself? So how do you interpret that? You have two verses that seem to contradict each other. Well, this is how you would interpret it. Even though they, the leaders in the church of Antioch, approved Paul and Barnabas' trip to Jerusalem, they did so under the direction of God. The whole thing was ordained by God. God was behind this whole thing. So therefore, Paul could say, by revelation, uh, God decided that Paul and Barnabas, God knew what the answer was going to be, but he knew that the Jews were what? Stiff-necked and hard-headed, right? And rebellious. So it is very, and perhaps Paul himself may have come up with a suggestion. Okay, we're not going to figure this thing out. Let's go to uh, Jerusalem to re resolve this issue. Don't you wish we had some kind of council today to resolve uh, doctrinal differences? Don't you wish you could have a, go to a council and say, Hey, uh, uh, what, uh, what say you? We have a disagreement on doctrine, this doctrine or that doctrine. Uh, but we do. In our council, it's called the Word of God, right? And yesterday I was teaching my kids a little bit, and I say, uh, one of the things I learned from Bible school when I went to, and it stuck with me uh, for the rest of my life, one of the professors said, you establish doctrine from crystal clear verses. Crystal clear verses. That's where you start. And once you establish that doctrine from a verse that's black and white that even a child can interpret, then the other verses that are kind of gray, kind of like, well, you don't understand, you try to, f you, no, you don't try to, you fit them in already established doctrine. And that's how you interpret the, those verses that seem like to, to sway one way or the other. And that's how you interpret the scripture. The Bible is very clear that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. There's no ambiguity there. If any verses suggests otherwise, and I'm not saying that there are such verses, but let's just say, hypothetically speaking, then you know that Christ died for your sins and he's the only way to heaven. So you, you already establish the doctrine and then you take those other verses that may kind of like teach something different. I'm not saying they do. And then you fit them into already established doctrine. And the people get messed up when they take those verses that are not crystal clear and they establish doctrine from their verses. Mm -hmm. And you usually find these people that they stick to those weird doctrines like uh, the Campbellites and the Church of Christ, Acts 2.38. Uh, be baptized, and then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Right? So they, they're messed up. They just stick one verse, and they stick to that verse, and they establish their, the whole denomination revolves around that one verse. But anyways, I'm not going to continue on that. So Paul and Barnabas and Titus and perhaps some others went to Jerusalem to get this issue resolved. Uh, Paul, God had told Paul, go to Jerusalem, and declare to the leaders there the gospel that you now preach. Tell the leaders in Jerusalem the gospel of grace that I have revealed unto you, Paul. Let them know that it is me who gave you that gospel, that you received it by revelation. But Paul was very smart. He was, he, I'm sure he would have made an excellent politician because when he went to Jerusalem, he didn't start uh, he didn't take a blowhorn and start telling everybody, Hey, uh, I'm here to tell you that uh, the gospel of grace is, so, is A, B, and C, and God revealed it to me. No. What did he do? What does he tell us he did? He had a private meeting with the apostles, with certain apostles. Not everybody. A private meeting to declare unto them what God had revealed unto him. Paul understood that had the, Jews, uh, the, had the Judaizers heard about Paul and heard what he was now teaching, they would have put pressure on the Jewish believers in Jerusalem, perhaps the leaders themselves, because they had influence. Because the Bible tells us some of these new believers, these Judaizers, were actually believers. They believed in Christ. But they were Pharisees. They were Sadducees. They were former Pharisees, former Sadducees, perhaps former council members, perhaps people that had uh, leadership positions uh, in, in Jewish society before they got saved. 
and they were able to exert that kind of pressure because of a previous role or perhaps even current role. Now we do find that these Judaizers eventually catch up to Paul in Acts chapter 21 and moments later Paul is accused of subverting the law and would have been killed by the mob if the Roman authorities did not rescue him. Remember that? When Paul was in Jerusalem, I said, Men and brethren, this is the man that teaches us to not follow the law of Moses. Some of these were believers. Uh, some of your worst enemies are going to be in the church. The lost people don't care about church, about church and what goes on in church. When I was younger, I grew up in, uh, in uh, the Greek free evangelical church. And they were always splitting because everybody, my dad used to say it the best, they want the pulpit. That's what he used to say. They want the pulpit. They want to be the leaders. They didn't do things through the scriptures. There was a couple of guys that wanted to be it. They wanted to be top gun, top man. They wanted to rule over, they wanted power. And the church was in conflict constantly, constantly. They kept splitting and joining and splitting and joining. And one group over there, one group over there. Well, imagine if they were all united, what they would do for Christ in the Greek community in Montreal. Well, so 80,000 Greeks in the Montreal area and when I was growing up, a lot of people. But they were always constantly fighting. Uh, remember the first Corinthians where Paul says, I am of Cephas, I am of Apollos, I am of Paul. All the divisions that the Corinthians have, well, it still goes on today. And here I want to read when the, Jews, when the Judaizers caught up to Paul eventually. So when Paul went to Jerusalem, he's telling the Galatians, I went to Jerusalem to sort this matter, but I went in there quietly and I met privately with certain leaders to tell them what God was doing in my life and what God had revealed to me. In Acts chapter 21, verse 20, and I'm going to show you what happened. God allowed this, but these Judaizers eventually caught up to Paul. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, this is speaking to Paul now, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews are which believe and they are zealous of the law? Do you guys get what they're telling Paul? Hey Paul, we know what you're, we know what you're teaching. But look around you, Paul. Look at all these Jews here. They have believed in Christ and they are all zealous of the law. So what are you telling us, Paul? In verse 21. And they are informed of thee. Who is the thee here? Who, who's the they? Sorry that they is the Jewish believers who are still zealous of the law. And, and they are informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. You see the accusation? Do you guys see it? Do you not see it here? Clear, clear right? What were they accusing Paul? And these were believers. These were Jewish believers who were still keeping the law, saying, Paul, you are going around telling the people, not telling the Jews not to keep the law. What, 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 what do you think you're doing, Paul? And 22. What is it therefore? The multitude must needs come together, for they will hear that thou art come. So they're saying, they're going to hear you here, Paul, and they're going to want to know why you're doing what you're doing. And eventually, what happened later, they tried to kill Paul, and the, Romans, the Roman authorities came in and rescued Paul from the mob. And the centurion asked, I believe it was the centurion, who is this man? Why is such an uproar being caused over this guy? So here, when he goes to Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15, Paul knows all this. If the Judaizers railroaded him, he would have been set back, greatly set back. He said he would have been running in vain. They would have stopped him. They would have stopped the work. Well, they, would, they couldn't stop God's work, but they would have been a great impediment in his ministry. If his work was going to be swallowed up by the Judaizers, who taught something contrary to Paul's gospel of grace, then Paul would be running in vain. He would be in constant opposition. And sometimes I, I feel that way, to be honest with you, because a lot of Christians, uh, and uh, don't get me wrong by saying this, you may get offended, but that's, I'm not trying to offend you. You go to these contemporary Christian churches and they teach something that's not exactly scriptural. You get influenced by the music that makes you feel good. Uh, and then they teach you all is well, the prosperity gospel. The God is uh, kumbaya, everything is fine. Everything is fine inside here, in your soul. That's where everything should be fine, inside here. The peace of God, the love of God, the joy of God. But around us, the Bible is clear, this world is evil. 
and we will suffer much affliction before we enter into the kingdom of, of, of God. So they don't teach the, all the scriptures. They just, they want to make people feel good because they, they're afraid to offend anybody. And today the problem is when you tell people, uh, I tell my kids, feel bad and change, they hate, they don't, people don't want to hear that. They want to think everything is fine. They, they want to continue in their comfort zone. But that's not what God wants. God wants us to serve Him and it's going to cost you to serve Him. You're going to suffer when you serve Him. You're going to have to get out of your comfort zone to serve Him. It's not going to be all uh, a, a bed of roses and the, and, uh, the yellow brick road. So, uh, and before, some of the kids probably do not know what the yellow brick road is, but that's some of old, old, old folks like us uh, know exactly what I'm saying. So God made sure that Paul was whisked away in Arabia by the Spirit so that he could be taught directly by Christ and not be tainted by another teaching contrary to the will of God. So God does that sometimes. God will take you away from certain environments, certain places to teach you some things because he doesn't want you to be tainted by all these uh, isms and schisms and false teachers around us. So here Paul is having, telling us that he's having a private meeting and Peter and John and James are likely there. And uh, Paul knows he has an ally with Peter because God used Peter to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. So Peter has some experience doing this. And that was in Acts chapter 10. So Paul would have, uh, Peter, sorry, would have been sympathetic to what Paul had to say. And here Paul continues in verse 3 of chapter 2 and he gives us some more information uh, regarding what happened with that meeting that he had with the apostles in Acts chapter 15. And he gives some of the details to the Galatians. In verse 3 he says, But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, there's the Greeks again, was compelled to be circumcised. Everything comes from Greek. Uh, but uh, And that because of the false brethren unawares brought in who came in privately to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. A very little detail here. We're going to get into that. And Paul says, rhetorically here, sarcastically, to whom we gave place by subjection. No, not even for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. In verse 5, we're going to spend a little bit of time on that, because the way it's written, it's kind of like difficult to, to, to understand. So Paul's point regarding Titus, and we mentioned a few things about Titus, that he was one of Paul's partners, a good man, uh, someone who was trustworthy and reliable. Uh, Paul said that when Titus came with him and they met with the leadership in Jerusalem, they accepted him, even though he was a Greek, even though he was uncircumcised. Paul's time in Galatians, you see, they had no issue with Titus being uncircumcised because if circumcision was still important, I guess what the leaders of the church of Jerusalem would have done? What was that? They would have put pressure on Titus to get circumcised if circumcision was part of salvation. Do you not think they would have done that? Yeah. The people who were pushing circumcision were false brethren. Paul calls them the concision elsewhere in another epistle. They would, uh, uh, and they had the habit of slipping into local churches and finding those who were vulnerable and they would spread their false doctrine to them. The Jew himself writes about this in Jude 1.4. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, uh, Paul says, this would have blown up in my face if circumcision were indeed an important issue regarding salvation. Because we know in the Old Testament that uh, in order for someone to uh, be a, a Jew and partake of the Mosaic Covenant, he had to be circumcised. And if a Gentile wanted to be, unless, unless you were a Canaanite, a Moabite, or an Ammonite, you could never ever uh, enter into the congregation of the Lord. That means, it didn't mean you couldn't believe in God. It meant you could never become a Jew, a proper Jew. Uh, we know that according to the law of Moses, if you were a Gentile and wanted to become a Jew, you would have to circumcise your males. And we know that's already in the law. So imagine if the Judaizers had found out that Paul was hanging around someone who was uncircumcised. They would have blown their lids. They would have blown their gaskets. In fact, chapter 21, when we talked about the Judaizers eventually caught up to Paul, uh, Paul was with another Greek called uh, uh, Trophimus. And 
these Judaizers who were zealous of the law, they were believers, but they were fanatics of, of one sort, of another sort. They said, Paul brought a Greek to the temple. Listen to this, Acts 21, 28. Now the point I'm trying to make here is that had the Judaizers heard that Paul brought Titus to Jerusalem with him and he was meeting with the apostles, the Judaizers would have become, would have become upset. And they, they eventually I told you they caught up with Paul and listened to Acts 21, 28, crying out, Men of Israel, help! They're, they're believers now. Context, they're believing Jews. They've trusted Christ as their Savior. Men of Israel, help! This is the man. Who are they pointing to? Paul, that teacheth all men everywhere against the people and the law and this place. In other words, he's telling people to forsake the temple, to forsake the law, to forsake Moses, to forsake the traditions. And furthermore, he brought Greeks. How could he? How dare he? He brought these dirty Greeks into the temple and hath polluted this holy place. You see that? Now, who is this Greek they were referring to? Trophimus, because they had, they had suspected. But Paul never did that. He never brought Trophimus into the temple, because Paul himself went to the temple. So imagine if these Judaizers, Paul was saying, had heard that Titus was with him, and he was meeting with the apostles. Imagine they would have blown the gasket. They would have ruined everything, he said. You have to watch out for, 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 for false brethren. You have to watch out for those who, uh, who try to bring you back into the subjection of the law. Christ came to free us from the law. And this is why I'm careful to teach Christian standards, but in a way that doesn't cause us to be in bondage of the law. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 20 and 22, the Bible says, Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of this world, why, as though living in the world, are ye subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not, which are all to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men. As Christians, we have to strive to live a holy life, not because we want to gain favor or approval with God. That's done through Christ. But we want to live a holy life because we love Him and we want to serve Him. The motive is different, completely different. So when we teach Christian standards, we have to be careful that we don't become legalists. Yeah. And I teach you, I, I believe I'm a biblicist first. If something, if the Bible teaches something, that's what I teach. I'm not going to carry the Baptist, some certain Baptist traditions and teach them as doctrines of God. They are simply right. the doctrines of men. I have to be careful with that. Right. I don't care who you are, what your position is. Regard, I, I really don't care. Now, I have to be careful. When I say I really don't care, what I'm saying is that if you hold to a position that's contrary to Scripture, I'm going to favor the Word of God rather than your position. Sorry. That's the point I'm trying to make. It's not that I don't care about what you have to say, but if your position is not doesn't go according to the Bible, I re you, it's your position. Uh, that's why what, we, what I say is it's my personal conviction, right? Now, I can teach you my personal conviction, but I also add a disclaimer saying this is what I do. It's not what the Bible says. Now, my personal conviction has to make sure that it doesn't contradict Scripture either. right? So we have to be careful with that. Paul never condemned circumcision, but also maintained that it had no bearing on salvation. Paul said, if you want to get circumcised, go ahead. There's nothing wrong with it. Is there anything wrong with you getting circumcised? If you want to. Does it do anything for your salvation? No. So whether you do it or you don't, it doesn't really matter. Right? Therefore, Paul says, it could never be forced upon the Gentiles, something that the leaders in Jerusalem agreed to. But the Judaizers were trying to force the Gentiles to get circumcised just as they were, and they were pushing circumcision because they believed it was important for salvation. Every, uh, but, uh, but the Bible doesn't teach that in the New Testament. And I want to encourage you, whoever's listening to this, or those who may be listening to it at a later time, uh, I want to encourage you, join the local church. Join a Bible-believing church. Join a church that teaches the Bible right. as your final authority, and not like I was telling my kids some, some doctrines. Uh, I said, you know where you learn that from? The church you used to go to. Because they were taught by someone else, by someone else, by someone else, and they never really looked at the Bible to see what right. it says. But Paul says, even though this meeting was private, certain, certain false brethren or certain brethren slipped into this private meeting unawares. 
and they did their best to bring us into subjection under the law. They did their best, but Paul stood his ground and gave him no time of day. Someone said they gate crashed this private conference with the apostles. And we get that from verse 5. Now, the wording, like I said in verse 5, is a little peculiar, and I'm going to read it in the way it should be read, because if you read it at the way uh, as it's written, you'll come away, to whom we gave place by subjection. Now, if you read that, it sounds like Paul is saying, we gave in to these people. But I think he's trying to be, the, the translators try to bring up Paul's sarcasm, because we know Paul was sarcastic. Uh, basically, it would be said as follows. To whom we gave place by subjection. No way. You think we gave in to them? No way, absolutely not. Do you think we submitted to them? So the we here, Paul, the we in verse 5 is Paul, Barnabas, and Titus, and perhaps another individual, but we know these three were involved in that meeting. But verse 5 can be reworded as follows. To whom we did not submit even for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. So he's referring, to, he's, he's assuring the Galatians that these people who slept into the meeting, who slept, who slipped into the meeting, tried really, really hard to bring us under the subjection of the law and under their false doctrine. But Paul says, I didn't even give them the time of day. I was only interested to hear what Peter, James, and John had to say. Now, just to show you that sometimes it's translate, it's difficult to translate from one language to another, I'm, gonna, I'm not trying to be funny over here. I'm going to give you uh, the word-for-word -word translation uh, for the first part of verse 5. If, I, if you read it in the Greek, and if you translate it word-for-word -word in the same word order, it would read as, as something as follows. To whom never for our we gave place the subjection. Does that make any sense? Now, in Greek, when you read it, it makes sense. But when you translate it word for word, what? To whom never for our we gave place the subjection. So you have to order the wording so it makes sense in English. Right? So even though some people say, oh, it's a literal translation. Yes, it's a literal translation. But at the same time, you have to, you have to word it in a way that, uh, that you can understand it in your own language. So... I just wanted to share that with you. So Paul realized if the message of the gospel of grace was compromised, it wouldn't only bring bondage for the Gentiles, it would also bring bondage for everyone who names the name of Christ. Paul knew that, and God knew that too. When it comes to the truth, never apologize to the truth. Stick to your guns. And never massage the truth because someone might get offended. And sometimes the truth will offend people. And sometimes I say things, I teach things that I believe God lays on my heart. I'm not infallible. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not entirely perfect. And if somebody calls me out on something, I won't get offended. But if it's the truth, I will stick to my guns. And if you get offended when the truth is preached to you, it says something about you. It right. says something about you. Uh, when I hear some things and if they bother me, the first thing I do is that, is it the truth? Is it the truth? Is this guy telling me the truth? So then I, I will start meditating on it. I don't get angry at the person. There's no point in getting angry at someone who's telling you something. Just meditate on it and see if that's the truth. So now, we're coming near the end of our lesson, and I want to speed up a little bit, because our time is running out. Uh, verse Chapter 2, verse 6. Paul was steadfast. But of these who seemed to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me. God accepteth no man's person. Some, exact, some of you got it. For they who seemed to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. Paul saying these people who slipped under the wares thought they were important. But I don't know who they are because I didn't pay attention to them because they're not important. <laughs> Only what God has told me is important. God doesn't care if you think you're important or not, Paul's saying. Those, these important brethren were of little use to me. They were of little value. They didn't add anything to the conversation. All they wanted to do was subvert the law. You see that? How the devil works. The devil works even through Christians. And now, what's important, Paul says, what did Peter, James, and John have to say? Verse 7. But contrary-wise, in opposite to what these guys were saying, the, 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 those who slipped unawares, those who I didn't give the time of day, those who weren't important to me, but contrary, when they saw the gospel 
contrary meaning that now Peter, James, and John has a different have a different point of view. But contrary wise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, for he that wrought effectually in Peter, he meaning the Holy Spirit, to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the brethren, the heathen, sorry, and they unto the circumcision. Only they would, that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was forwarded to do. So now Paul is saying that what really mattered was what James, what Peter, James, and John had to say. Not what the other brethren had to say. The, those who thought were important, but were not important. Uh, the gospel that Peter preached and the gospel that Paul preached were the same. Salvation was by faith alone in Christ. Paul's main ministry, though, was to the Gentiles, whereas Peter's main ministry was to the Jews. That's the difference. It doesn't mean that Paul never preached to Jews and Peter never preached to Gentiles because we find Peter preaching to Gentiles in Acts chapter 10. And many times, Paul witnessed to Jews who got saved. Paul didn't care what those important brethren had to say, but what Cephas, a.k.a. Peter, James, the Lord's brother, and John had to say. They accepted that Paul was ordained and called by God to be the apostle to the Gentiles and had no issues with the gospel of grace. They had no issues with what Paul was saying because they understood. Paul made it clear that what I'm preaching is by the revelation of God. So they sent a letter back with Paul, Barnabas, and Titus to the people in Antioch. And this is what the letter said in Acts 50, 19, verse 20. Wherefore, my sentence is that we trouble not them, that is the Gentiles, which from, he says it here, which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. So what, in a nutshell, what this letter is saying, you cannot take the Gentiles who have trusted Christ and put them under the law. You cannot make them subject to the law. But they should at least stop eating meat offered to idols Again, this was not this was not doctrine. This was a suggestion, and they should stop fornicating because the Gentiles were known to fornicate, and from things strangled. That means uh, and from blood. That means that animals that were not killed in a kosher manner. And they made this clear that this was for the Gentiles, and they never really addressed the law and the Jew. See, that's that's what they they, they there was a lot of pressure even on the apostles to uh, still keep still keep the law. In fact, in the uh, in, uh, in a later lesson, we're going to look at the fact that Paul tells Peter, you dissemble. Why do you act like a Jew in front of the Jews and a Gentile in front of the Gentiles? Peter, you're, you're trying to please two groups of people here. That's not right. And we're going to get into that in a future lesson. So Paul and Barnabas were now free to preach the gospel of grace to the Gentiles. No adherence to the Mosaic law was required. Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles, but so was Barnabas. And let's not forget this, right? Barnabas, too, was an apostle. But the one thing they did ask Paul to do is do not forget the poor, poor saints. And Paul did that. Uh, if you see here in uh, Galatians chapter uh, 2, verse 10, that they encourage Paul uh, that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was forward to do. So they said, look, Paul, we understand, but there's one request that we want from you. We have a lot of poor people here in Jerusalem, a lot of poor Christians uh, can you please keep them in mind and try whatever you can uh, as you're preaching the gospel of the Gentiles, see if you can help the poor saints. Because remember, in Jewish society, the moment you received Christ as your Savior, you were ostracized. You were completely rejected. You were, you were thrown out of society. Your business, you would lose your business contacts. You would lose your customers. It was hard for the... For, you gave a lot when you trusted Christ in Jewish society. And that occurs today uh, many times. In fact, Paul mentions this in his uh, subsequent letters to other churches. In fact, he says in Romans 15, 25 to 26, But now I go unto Jerusalem to minister unto the saints, for I have pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are in Jerusalem. So everywhere Paul went, after he preached Christ and people got saved and he established churches, he goes, Look, is there anything you guys can do to help the poor saints in Jerusalem? In 1 Corinthians 16, 3, And when I came, Whosoever ye shall approve by your letters, them will I send to bring your liberality unto Jerusalem. Paul's saying, I'm not trying to be a charlatan here, I'm not trying to trick you, but 
any money that you guys can collect, uh, bring so up, nominate someone. You can come with me and we'll take the money, that contribution, to the poor saints in Jerusalem. And we should too. One of the things that I think many churches fail is that they don't have ministries to the poor. But it, it's kind of hard in today's society. I'm not trying to justify the fact that we don't have anything in this church. We're still a young church. But there's a lot of fakes out there. There's a lot of people who, who feign to be poor. Uh, some of those, there was one guy, a story, I'll never forget it. He would drive up in his Cadillac. He would uh, park it in the, in the parking lot, the shopping center far away. He would get, get dressed into his rags. He'd go walk away a few, I don't know how many feet, to the closest corner. And he'd sit down and he'd start begging for money. And when his shift was over, he'd go back, collect his money, get into his Cadillac and drive away. There's a lot of charlatans out there. And Paul himself never forgot the charge that they gave him. When he went back to Jerusalem, he brought this, uh, this offering to the poor saints in Jerusalem. The Bible doesn't tell us when he did, but many believe it happened in Acts chapter 21, verse 17. And when we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly, indicating that when Paul went back, to, he finally made it back to Jerusalem, where he was also subsequently arrested. He had this contribution that he's been collecting all these years, and he helped the poor saints in Jerusalem. So it's unfortunate that we cannot help the poor at this point, but uh, hopefully maybe perhaps the Lord uh, will help us in the future. But uh, <clears throat> but we have to be careful because there are so many people that uh, ask for money uh, that they look poor, but they're not. I remember a couple always kept asking to borrow money and uh, kept lending them money. They kept paying back, asked more and more. Finally, I said to them, look, we got to sit down and come up with a budget. You know, that was the last time I was asked to, uh, they asked me to borrow money. It's, it was never a matter of not having enough money, but squandering the little that they have. If you can't put food on the table, if you can't pay your rent, why do you have a $200 cell phone plan? Why do you have a cable TV plan? Why do you rent your furniture? Why are you doing all these things that you shouldn't be doing when, you, when you're tight, tight for money? It doesn't make any sense to me. It doesn't make any sense to me. But anyways... As Christians, we are supposed to uh, help the poor. In fact, I'm going to end with James chapter 2, verse 15 through 16. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful of the body, what doth it profit? Paul says, with words you cannot help someone who is poor. With words you cannot warm someone. With, word, with words you cannot feed their belly. And uh, a lot of churches, what was that? Paul, I mean James, James, sorry, James. And there's a lot of churches that have pantries, which are good. Maybe perhaps in the future, the uh, Lord allows us, we, uh, our church grows and we have a, a building that perhaps we'll start a ministry to the poor, we'll have a pantry. And uh, the church that we used to go had a pantry. Uh, and the way it worked was that uh, people would come in, they would sign their name, and they would hear the pastor give them a, a presentation of the gospel. That was a requirement. Sign your name, address, who you are, and we'll give you a quick gospel message, and then we can give you some food for the pantry to feed your family. So thank you for, uh, this brings us to the end of our lesson this evening. Uh, next week we'll continue in chapter 2, and thank you for joining us this evening. We pray this lesson has been a blessing to you, and uh, pray that you have a good rest of the week.